Wait, where, where, where are you? You're in the product hunt office? Yeah. Oh. Strong. Oh yeah, I, I got a new gig. I got a new gig. Congratulations, <laughs> dude. Thank you. And thank you for the, um, what we talked about previously. That, that yeah. Was, that meant a lot. Cool. Anyway, so you have a friend in Russia that's kind of famous. And I was wondering what was, what was it like interviewing uh, Ed Snowden? Oh yeah, you got the screenshot there. Uh, yeah, I yeah. consider that a privilege. I think, uh, I think Edward Snowden is a patriot of the highest order. Uh, I think that guy was literally willing to trade, maybe not his physical life. I don't think he ever thought he was at risk of, uh, of you know, uh, of being physically killed. But his freedom, as we know it, I think he was willing to trade to expose the systematic violation of our constitutional rights um, and continued lying uh, by the executive branch about it. I mean, our our entire country is founded upon these notions that uh, this balance of power, that the executive branch will be kept in check by the judicial and the legislative branch. But when one of those branches is just persistently lying to the other two uh, and lying to the American public, then the system breaks down. Like, I believe there are things that not all of us should know, that there are, there are uh, bad guys out there that need to be tracked in secrecy, that there are plots that need to be foiled from time to time, uh, that there are things by their nature, if they were known, would destabilize our information advantage. And so, and for that, we have secret committees of Congress and we have secret courts who are able to deal with clandestine services, in the executive branch. But when the secret committees in Congress admit they've been, you know, say uh, they've been lied to over and over again, and, they're in, and there's lying going on with public hearings. And when the special FISA court that they have, the judiciary branch comes out and says, despite the fact that we approve over 99% of these requests, we've been lied to too, then, the United States is breaking down, that what we have here isn't actually working. And so, uh, and so for me to see someone willing to risk everything they have, uh, and you know, I don't think he particularly enjoys Russia. It certainly wasn't his original ambition to end up there. Um, and, you know, he's facing certainly right now, I mean, there's just, there is no whistleblower exemption to, uh, to the laws he broke. And so he's facing treason charges. Uh, I don't see any president being willing to pardon him anytime soon. And so that's a guy who gave up his entire life. And it's funny that he can still be revered as a criminal, even though we've had some legislative reform as a result of his disclosures. And so um, yeah. it's pretty messed up. Now that said, let me tell a story in fairness. So uh, last year I was doing a, um, a, a fundraising round table with the president. We had this series of these round tables where the president would come in and you know, if you were, if you gave enough money and you were also a tech leader, you could sit 20 people around, around a table with the president and it was unfiltered Q and A for like an hour, hour and a half. It was amazing. I mean, the, just that experience. And I got to sit in eight or 10 of those, uh, and kind of moderate them. And so one of the early ones I saw everyone kind of not asking real questions. They were like, Hey, can you help me on this intellectual property export law? Or, you know, just kind of bullshit. Like, provincial questions. And I was like, we have the leader of the free world right here. So I asked them, um, hey, Mr. President, you know, I've lived abroad, I've been outside the United States, and people would tease us for like eating too much and driving too big cars and drinking too much gasoline and fair point. But the thing I was always proudest about as an American is that we have true social mobility in our country and we have the most transparent, accountable justice system in the world. It's like growing up, that's what I always felt. I was like, fast forward to today. And the data are clear that we don't have the social mobility that we used to. If you're poor, overweight, and black, you're going to likely stay poor, overweight, and black because of a digital divide, nutritional divide. You know, we have food deserts in these neighborhoods. We have uh, the justice divide. You know, look at what's happening with incarceration rates and, and uh, you know, death row. And I was just like, and so we don't have that, that mobility that we used to. And we've like suspended habeas corpus. We have warrantless wiretapping. This is increased note in declarations. I said, you know, and, um, and, and I brought up Guantanamo. I'm like, we have a uh, hundred plus guys sitting in Guantanamo without any actual uh, due process. And so I said, so if we don't have social mobility and we don't have transparent accountable justice, what does America stand for? And the rest of the table was like, oh no, you didn't. Like <laughs> you just asked the threat line. It was just like, oh shit, it's about to get real. Uh, but I, I meant it. I was just like, so do we just stand for, you know, capital availability? Do we just stand for the best place to start your startup? Is that it? 
And so he took a shot at answering it, but it felt like a campaign speech a little bit. And, uh, you know, and he kind of said at one point, like, hey, in America, you can be anything you want to be. And I was like, Mr. President, I'm sorry to interrupt you. And by the way, interrupting a president is not something I would advise any of you do. But, uh, but you know, he said, uh, he said, you know, you can be anything you want to be in America. And I was like, not exactly, man. Um, the data aren't clear there. And so he, he kind of tried to take the, take, you know, go with the question. And then he kind of veered off and answered a couple other questions. And at the end, he was supposed to circle the room and do portraits with everybody. And instead, he walked back over to me and he came up to me and I'm not I'm not an actor, so I'm not going to do this the most amazing justice. But he basically walks up to me and he said and he, and he, um, he says, hey, Chris, good question. Uh, you know, we currently have and I'm going to make this number up. It was something like 126 guys in Guantanamo. He's like, you know, intelligence tells us that, you know, uh, you know, 101 of those guys, if they were repatriated to their countries, tried and found innocent and set free probably don't uh wouldn't present a, a clear and present danger to the united states and so we're, we're convinced they're bad guys but if they were set free probably wouldn't present a clear and present danger in the united states so that means there are 25 and again these are just round numbers but there are 25 guys in guantanamo who both have the will and the capability to destroy thousands of american lives and then he reaches out and puts his arm on my shoulder and is like so what's your suggestion? And I was just like, holy shit, you have the worst job in the world, right? So it's, uh, it was fascinating. Like these are, these are easy things to debate uh, from the armchair. They're certainly easy um, you know, issues to debate. But in that moment, you know, your metal is tested. Uh, now we have the benefit from the Snowden stuff of knowing that no one, not in even the Chelsea Manning trials, has anyone been able to show that anyone's life was risked by the information disclosed, um, that, you know, sure, a lot of people are embarrassed, and particularly the liars, but, uh, but there hasn't been a single death, there hasn't been a single injury that can be linked to any of these disclosures and stuff like that. So it's actually been a little bit easier. But, but I think the more you um, really chew on these issues, and the more you really think about them, I, you know, I have found that when you're young, you know, what, what a professor of mine in college, Otto Hentz used to say is like, you come in as a table pounding friend, uh, freshman, you know, you're just like, this is the way it is. Everything's very black and white. And if you've really pushed hard in college, you, uh, you've learned to wrestle with nuance and think hard about the fact that there's a lot of gray areas and things. You've really started to wrestle with questions. Not everything's always so obvious, but I found as you get, in my experience, as I get older, uh, as I have the freedom, I think, to be more authentic, to be more honest with myself and an assortment of diverse life experiences, I start to come more and more to the conclusion that uh, to the conclusion that a lot of things are black and white. And then when it comes to the United States of America, the actual core principles, not the bullshit framer, fucking misinterpreted bullshit that comes from the fundamentalist Tea Partyists, but the core notion of the fact that a government by the people has to be you know, for the people, for the benefit of the people, and is built to be with power distributed among these three branches, that when that's subverted, you literally undermine the entire thing that the United States stands for. And so um, that's why I consider Edward Snowden to be a, uh, to be a person I admire and that I think is, is worthy of the respect and admiration of most people. By the way, the basis for that chat I had with him is that I am interviewing him on stage uh, for a summit series event in November. And um, that's, that was awesome. So we, we were supposed to do an hour prep and it went for, uh, it went for three hours. And you know, he, he, he did say like, assume that every moment of this is being listened to. Uh, and probably every moment of everything you do after this will be listened to. Like any list you're not already on, you're definitely on now. And, um, and so that's always funny knowing that you're, you're at least playing to, a, a, you know, an audience of plus a few more. So, uh, what an experience though. Meet you on mute. Is there a non-zero, a non-zero chance that you run for office someday? Uh, no, it's a zero chance. I, I don't, I don't ever want to be, uh, I mean, I don't want people to know where I live. I don't want to feel like I owe anything to the general populace. 